Yo, what's up, everyone? Uh, this is Terry with College Football Stop. Um, <clears throat> I want to get into this, man. Uh, today is obviously October 9th, 2023. A couple days passed uh, since Ohio State played Notre, or sorry, since Ohio State played Maryland. Um, we got to get into this game, man. This game was crazy. The first half, I mean, I was texting my homie saying, look, man, they were just not good this year. Obviously, they picked it up in the second half, but still wasn't great. I mean, Maryland kind of made some mistakes in the second half. Obviously, Ohio State did adjust, but we'll get into all that. Um, so I do. I, I'm going to go over my offensive position grades, defensive position grades, um, and then some players of the game a little bit later in the show. But I want to just start by talking about the game, what we saw, and uh, especially, like I said, you know, the first half was kind of it was a little ridiculous. So um, I see a lot of people talking about how um, Ohio State's run game is a problem. And I agree with that. The run game was not great. No one's talking about the fact that Ohio State didn't have their number one running back. You know, a lot of people say that Chip Trainum um, is that guy or, you know, Chip Trainum could be the number one running back. And I do agree with that. I actually think that him getting uh, RB1 reps this week is going to help him tremendously. And he'll be able to look at those reps and learn from them. But I also think that Chip made some mistakes and this wasn't his best game. So, again, the offensive line wasn't great. The running game wasn't great. And if we're talking about the first half, I mean, nothing was great except, I mean, the defense was still solid. You know, in the first half, they they gave up 10 points. Seven of those came from that botched punt bullshit that happened. Um, I don't think that was a fake punt. I think it was they were trying to snap it to the punter, and uh, the ball just bounced off the ground. I don't know. I mean, Ohio State in the first half just, I mean, I, I wish I would have looked this up, but they had tons of penalties. All over the place, man. It's like every single part of the team was out of whack. So um, the second half, obviously, they pulled it together. The defense was locked down after the first drive. They adjusted and kind of took care of business. Um, the offense was still clunky but was decent. So I don't know. We'll get into all that. I do want to go ahead and dive into the position grades. Um, I think I'm going to leave with the good and then follow with the bad. So I'm going to start with the defensive position grades this time. Um, I know everybody would like to talk about the quarterback and all that good stuff, but We'll get into the quarterback last because I got a lot to say about that. Um, all right, so going through the defensive position grades that I have here, um, looking at the defensive tackles, I actually think the defensive line played really good in this game um, all, all across the board. Um, I'm going to say the defensive tackles played at like an A-minus level. Um, and the only reason why it's not like an A-plus is simply just because with guys like Mike Hall and Tyleek Williams, I think that this unit has super high expectations, so I'm grading them against their own expectations. They still were making plays. They still were controlling the line of scrimmage for most of the game. Um, but, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put them uh, with too high of a grade just simply because there wasn't a ton of plays being made. And I think that with Tyleek Williams and my call, I expect to see more plays made throughout a game, especially when they play a lot. Like, I think uh, t I, I heard someone say Tyleek Williams had 70 snaps in this game which is an insane amount for a dude as big as him. But, I mean, he was out there doing his thing, so you can't take it away from him. Um, and then the, the second position I want to talk about, I separate the defensive line. Um, a lot of people have been giving the defensive ends a lot of flack this year, and I've been one that's been defending them the whole time. I think the defensive ends on this team are solid. Um, I think that the issue that we've been running into this year is that we have two – I guess, strong side defensive ends uh, with JTT and Jack Sawyer. Those are two guys that are very similar in the way that they play and their size and their speed. Um, obviously, I think JTT is better than Jack Sawyer right now. Um, so the, the, having them on the field together is just not a good combination. You saw in this game, um, we have more of JTT and Caden Curry out there and then also Kenyatta Jackson. I, I do think that the way that they did it this game is probably what they should do more often, and that's have JTT and Jack Sawyer rotate on one side and then Kenyatta Jackson and Caden Curry on the other side. The only way that I would say make an exception to that would be maybe if you're playing a team that is going to run the ball more, like looking at a team like Wisconsin, maybe having JTT and Jack Sawyer out there would be a good thing. Um, but with a team that can run or throw at any time, I think you want to have that speed rusher out there, which you're looking at a guy like, uh, Caden Curry or Kenyatta Jackson and honestly when Caden Curry was out there he was making plays and Kenyatta Jackson um, 
it, he drew a hold, and I see a couple other plays where he got held or he was re- about to blow a play up, and he didn't just was like one step off there. Um, I give the the defensive ends an A. Um, I think they played phenomenal, especially because their expectations are a little bit lower this, right now because of the way that they've played all year. So to see um, JTT get a sack, to see him hitting guys in the backfield constantly, uh, that's just something that we haven't seen all year, and I hope that that, that this game is going to be like that pick-me-up game for that unit and that they're, we're going to see them start dominating because I do think they have the potential and I think that they've done a great job as far as like playing the run this year, which is something that's very underrated. Everybody wants to look at sack numbers, but I think JT Tuimola is one of the best defensive ends in the country against the run, and that is something that's being overlooked. I still have him as a first-round pick. We'll see how that plays out, but I'm standing on that. I think he's going to be a first-round pick, maybe late first round, but and it, honestly, he could work his way up higher if we start seeing more of that pass rush kick in as the year goes on we start playing teams that are going to be doing more play action more slow developing stuff um, all right so the next unit i want to get into is another one that has been a hot topic after this game uh the linebacker unit i personally think that the linebackers are not bad players we've seen a lot of uh, i've heard a lot of people talking about them about being like garbage or bad i don't think that either one of them are bad football players I think that Tommy is a better football player than Steel Chambers is. And I think that we're seeing we're seeing that because you're seeing Steel Chambers get removed from the field for Cody Simon. I also think Tommy's a better football player than Cody Simon. So I don't know. I the the way that they're being deployed this year, it reminds me a lot of 2021, and that worries me. Um, because if you go back to the really a lot of the games in that year, but especially the Michigan game, they were they run the ball, I think, all but two times in the second half or something like that. Uh, I think they only threw twice, and they scored points and kind of put the game away. And the way that our linebackers are playing reminds me of that year because they're not really attacking. They're sitting back and reading and kind of letting the offensive line get depth and get to them and reach them, and then that's creating big holes in the run game. And our safeties are having to fill. I can't wait to talk about them. They played phenomenal this game, and... I think they've played phenomenal all year. So Perry Eliano, um, you know, after last year, he was getting a lot of flack, but I think that he deserves some credit because the safeties have been playing great. And it's just something that I didn't foresee happening, especially with Josh Proctor. We'll get into him in a little bit a later, a little bit later also, excuse me. Um, but the safeties have been kind of picking up for the, the slack that the linebackers have had. Um, as far as the linebackers, I'm going to give them like a D grade in this game. Uh, I mean, I I didn't really see them making plays in the pass game. And then as far as the run game goes, I feel like they're just taking way too long to dissect what's happening. And what what's, I'm sorry, what's coming of that is that teams are running gap scheme, run schemes on us, and they're tearing us up with it. Because if you're going to let the offensive guard or the offensive tackle pull around, get through the line of scrimmage, and then get and reach you before you before you try to get to the gap that you need to be in, it's just, that's simply just not going to work. I don't know what's causing them to be so like hesitant this year. Um, hopefully, Jim Knowles can work with them and maybe uh, get them playing a little more aggressive like they were last year. Because I don't necessarily think that our linebackers playing aggressive last year is what caused us to give up big gash plays. I think it was more so combining the lineback- linebackers and the secondary playing aggressive at the same time. So you're bringing everybody up to the line of scrimmage. You're having everybody attack the line of scrimmage. And if, if you do that and you miss one gap, then you see what happens with the Diamond Edwards play two times in a row last year against Michigan. Everybody attacked. There was one gap open. He hit that one gap. There was nobody even there to even to make the tackle. So I think that we need to mix that up a little bit, get those linebackers going downhill again, um, and then ne- not necessarily do that with the secondary so they can clean up anything if it does uh, sprinkle out. But I'm not going to grade them well until I see them playing well. I have them at a D. I think that's what I said. And I'm going to stick with that. Uh, And then moving into the corners. uh, The corners, I felt like, played a really good game against Maryland. Um, They had a couple plays on them. But, I mean, it can be said as simple as this. Maryland has good wide receivers. Mike Loxley's done a good job with that team. And they may not be as good as uh, the best teams in the Big Ten in the trenches. But they have better skill on the outside, I would say, than probably... I mean, they're probably up there with Michigan and Penn State in terms of the skill on the outside. 
And, I mean, those guys were making plays. Like, you look at the first touchdown that Davis Nigbenosen gave up. He was in good coverage, about an inch away from that being a pass breakup. And that receiver, and he also had the receiver's hand tied down. And that receiver made a one-hand catch, and he jumped up in the air and did it too. So, I mean, again, those guys are, are good players. You saw them throughout the game too, making, like, back shoulder catches. I mean, as a defense, as a cornerback, there's not really much you can do about that. If you're in good coverage and that quarterback just puts the ball where only his receiver can get it, unfortunately, you're going to give up a catch on that play. And what you got to do is get that guy to the ground, and that's what they did. So I'm giving the corners a good grade. I'm grading them out as an A also. Um, I think that there were multiple plays where they were they were locking shit up and kind of making it to where uh, Tua Leah didn't have anywhere to go with the ball. And then also, you know, you saw Denzel Burke out there. I think he had a couple of pass breakups. Um, Igwinosin, he really didn't get challenged after the beginning of the game. He got he got challenged just to start the game off. And then after that, they didn't really go his way, but maybe one one or two more times. And when they did, I mean, it didn't end well for them. So, um, again, I mean, if you're noticing the defensive, I think the defense played phenomenal. Um, and the grades are going to show that other than the linebackers. But, I mean, you're going to have a weak link on your defense regardless. One of the units is going to be the worst, but they just simply need to play better. And I think it's time that we see C.J. Hicks. Um, I know I was talking about the corners, but I forgot to mention this when talking about the linebackers. Uh, Jim Knowles made a statement in the beginning of the year that he was going to unleash C.J. Hicks, and he's probably played like 10 snaps this year. Um, but the way that they're asking the guys to play now, you need more athletic players out there, and that's what he is. So if you're going to tell me that these the other linebackers are going to play because they can diagnose the defense better, they can call out the defense better, but then they're not playing well and they're not doing those things properly. We need to see that young young kid out there. And honestly, there was multiple plays that Maryland made that I think that C.J. Hicks would have ran down, that the other linebackers were just simply not fast enough to get there or didn't get to their gap fast enough, and you know those plays scored out. So, um, All right, the, la the last position I want to talk about here, um, before I get into that, let's see, we got... Chris Drew in the chat. Back at it. What's up, Chris? Homie, man. This team's crazy to talk about, brother. This has been a wild year for, for uh, Ohio State because every single game has had, like, is a roller coaster. Ryan Day always talks about don't ride the roller coaster. For fan, for the fan base, this year has been an absolute fucking roller coaster, up and down all year. And it's it, even within the game, we're going each quarter. We don't even know what's going to happen. So I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, let's finish up with the defense here. Um, I have safeties. Um, I think they actually played the best out of any unit on the entire team in this game. And, I mean, two turnovers from the safeties is is obviously going to help that. But even if you take away, like, one of those turnovers, I still think they were the best unit. They were coming up and they were hitting people. Um, they were filling gaps. They were making plays in the pass game and, and coverage. So kudos to Perry Eliano. Um, you know, he's got Josh Proctor playing, like, a, a draftable guy. I think... Proctor could play his way into like a, a top three round pick. Um, Lathan, I think he that's kind of where his ceiling is too. Uh, but again, when you have guys like that and they're making plays, I mean, that's that's what makes this defense run. When, when Jim Knowles said it's a safety-driven defense, he meant that because if those safeties are playing good and they're feeling right and they're um, in coverage the way that they're supposed to be, it's hard to score on this team, and that's what they're doing now. And I think I would I would lump Sonny Styles into that too. I, he's he's really like a hybrid linebacker safety, um, and he really probably should be on the field, uh, especially if the team runs three wide receivers. Sonny Styles should be on the field, and so should Jordan Hancock. And I personally think that maybe uh, Steel Chambers or yeah, I would say probably Steel Chambers should come off the field. And I don't know, man. I just think that the way that we're deploying our defense doesn't make sense sometimes. Even when you look back to like the Notre Dame game, like I know they had tight ends on the field, but it's third down and eighteen or whatever the hell it was, um, in the, in the the drive the second drive that they scored a touchdown on, it's third down and eighteen or something like that, and you got Tommy Eichenberg and Cody Simon on the field and they throw it right over top of you. So they need to do some adjustments there. I think that we saw some of that in this game uh, with Sonny Styles and Jordan Hancock on the field at the same time. Um, all right, so that was it for the defense. Again, just overall A-plus for the defense. I mean, they gave up 17 points. Seven of those came on uh, the first drive where the punters just rolled the ball back like a bowling ball. Um, I, again, I can't say enough good things about them this year. And uh, I think that the 
the cornerback unit is like the heart and soul of this defense. You look at Igbenosin and Burke, they're out there popping people. Combine that with the safeties, and teams are just going to have, have trouble scoring on this team all year. You're going to have to execute. Unless we run into a situation against a team like Michigan or Penn State where they're very successful in the run game, that's what worries me with the linebackers not playing well. But I think that Jim Knowles will adjust to that, and I think that the guys that we have out there in coverage are good enough this year where if you take one of those safeties and bring them down to the line of scrimmage, that's not necessarily going to kill our protection because I don't think that Penn State or Michigan's wide receivers are going to be able to to like bury our secondary and get loose. And you know, again, I don't I don't see that happening even if they're in just simple man coverage and it's just Denzel Burke and um, sorry Denzel Burke and Davis Nibonosin out there kind of on islands. So. Uh, yo, what's up, Mark? Brother? Thanks for watching, man. If you guys have any questions in the chat, let me know. Obviously, like the video, all that good stuff. Um, let's see here. All right, let's get into the offense. I'm saving the quarterback for last. I'm making you guys wait because I I got a lot to say about that position, but I'm just going to go ahead and get into the running backs. <clears throat> I felt like they played decent, put it that way. Um, I was actually kind of shocked when they put Mayan Williams out there and then started running plays to the outside. I hated that. I don't. I mean, I think we didn't really try to run the ball up the middle at all in this game. But when, when Chip Trainum was out there, I felt like the run game was better, and I expect that because I do think that Chip has the ability to be one of the best running backs on this team. I think that he, him and Trey are just a good combination. You have Trey who is a shifty, fast dude, and then you have Chip who is also fast enough to be like a running back one, but he can hit people and. He can, you know, get the short yardage, short yardage plays that we need sometimes. So, hey, Chris, I can't wait, bro. Let me let me run through these other positions and we'll get into this quarterback stuff because I'm about dumb. I don't know. Whatever. We'll, we'll we'll get into it. All right. So, to the running back for the running backs, I don't want to get too much into it. They had like three yards of carry. Um, the offensive line didn't play well, which we'll get into that too. But I, I'm gonna give the running backs like a C. You know, I don't again. I don't think that they did anything special to help the the offensive line, but I also don't think the offensive line per, played great. So we'll go ahead and transition into that now. Um, as far as the offensive line goes, uh, you guys are fun. All right, anyway, as far as the offensive line goes, I think that Ohio State did a good job this time of mixing up the run game. I feel like it was not a predictable run game but what pisses me off is that they were not predictable and it didn't work. So there was multiple plays in this game where you had offensive linemen pulling and they didn't know who to block. And I don't know if maybe Maryland was confusing them up front or something, but I don't think that Maryland's front seven is good enough where they should be able to confuse Ohio State and make it where they can't get to the line of scrimmage or get three yards on a play. Um, I'm gonna, I give the offensive line, I'm going to say like a C grade. I don't think it was as bad as everybody made it out to be. And I think that some of the pass protection issues were actually on Kyle McCord. <laughs> we'll get into that, like I said. Um, I'm going to give the offensive line a C, and I'm going to move on from that. Tight end is going to be an easy one. Um, I feel like they did a good job blocking in this game when they were out there. And Cage Stover, obviously, with the you know the long touchdown. He only had two receptions, but like 60 yards. Um, tight ends, I'm going to give them an A. I think the tight end unit has been solid this year, and they had some blocking issues early. They're probably going to have a little bit of blocking issues if Ohio State's going to ask them to block in space. But if you keep them close to the line of scrimmage, I think they're going to be just fine. And honestly, Kate Stover's been a weapon this year in the past game. A lot of people don't want to admit that because he had a bad game against Michigan last year. I don't care. I know what I'm seeing. When he runs routes, he gets open. When he has the ball in his hands, he's freaking stiff-arming dudes' faces into the ground. I'm giving Kate Stover his credit. I'm giving the tight ends an A grade. Uh, and then on to the wide receiver unit. I don't know how to grade the wide receivers because I feel like they were open the whole first half and we're not getting the ball. Um, but you got Marvin Harrison Jr. out there doing Marvin Harrison Jr. things, and I think just simply having him out there doing that is enough to grade this unit out as an A. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Mar Marv is a freak, and I think this was the first game where we kind of seen, uh, I don't know if it was Kyle McCord or Ryan Day that made this decision, but we kind of just had the attitude of fuck it, just throw it up. Marv's down there somewhere. I know my dude Chris Drew always says that in the uh, on his show. Just throw it. Marv's down there somewhere, and it worked. I mean, Marv's gonna come up with the ball over fifty percent of the time, 
and it's going to be an interception like probably 2% of the time if you just throw it up and it's him one-on-one in coverage. Like even then, I don't know, has anybody ever intercepted a ball that was intended for Marvin Harrison Jr.? That would be a good stat. I need to look that up. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll look that up for my daily stat dive, which we'll do tomorrow because I forgot to do it today. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get into uh, the quarterback. This is the, the position everybody wants to talk about, whether they're making excuses for the quarterback or whether they're saying that the quarterback situation is bad. We have to talk about it. I don't know what it is with Kyle McCord. I don't know if because listen, I like to watch all 22 films. Shout out to my dude Chris Drew that's in here and his platform uh, with Zach Smith. They have the all 22 film breakdowns and they're on their Patreon. And I subscribe to it because honestly, I would not be as smart of a football fan if I didn't watch that. And there's at least six to seven times in every single game where Kyle McCord has a guy open and just doesn't take the throw. And I mean, when I say open, I'm not talking like 10 yards open, but I'm talking like college football open, not NFL windows. I'm talking Marvin Harrison Jr. in one-on-one coverage, and he's about to run an outbreaking route, and he snaps the guy off, and Kyle McCord looks at him for an extra two seconds, and he's like, nah, I'm going to come to my check down. And then if that's not there, that's when he starts trying to scramble, and he does three juke moves just to get back to the line of scrimmage. I don't know. I, I'm not I'm not feeling what they have going on with Kyle McCord at quarterback. And it, it makes me wonder, because I've, I, I was impressed with some of the things I saw from Devin Brown earlier in the year. However, it makes me wonder if maybe that was kind of smoke and mirrors. And maybe Devin Brown is just not that good. I don't know. Because I think that if he was as good as I thought he is, he would be starting right now for this team. Because it just it just doesn't make sense. Like, okay, I know that the offense got better in the second half. What nobody wants to talk about is that Maryland also went for a fourth down on the third yard on their own 30 yard line in the second half and got stopped. So Ohio State's defense created those points. Okay, here, give them the ball on the 30 yard line. You better be able to score. So one of those touchdowns was that. One of the touchdowns was a pick six in this game. So you that's 14 points right there that were not, I mean, okay, the offense had to score from the 30, but like that's 14 points that was not really generated by our offense. And this is Maryland that Maryland that we're playing against. What was the score? Let me look it up. Hold on. I don't even remember what the score was of this game because I was heated watching this game. But yeah, I mean, again, so I'm going to take those 14 points off when I find this and let's see how many points that our offense actually generated because it wasn't a lot. And a lot of people talked about, okay, it was 37. So you take away uh, 14 from that, it's 20, 23. 23 points against Maryland. Maryland is not good. Their, their defense is not good. So, And I, I personally, a lot of people want to blame the offensive line. And you know, I personally think that most of the offensive issues that we've had this year have been on the quarterback position. A lot of people want to blame play calling. I think that it could be a little better. I also don't think that Ryan Day should have to scheme wide receivers 10 yards open for them to get the ball. Uh, let me see. Uh, we got a couple things in chat here. Um, sit the current linebackers. <laughs> Mark said he was sit the current linebackers. Listen, I'm with you, man. I, they they're not playing good. That's there's no other way to put it. So, um, but back to the quarterback, Chris Drew said in the chat, we go three and out way too often, and that's true. Like this is Ohio State, bro. You have the best offensive talent around you of anybody in the country. You have Marvin Harrison Jr. Like we got people posting on Twitter posting their wide receiver stats next to Marvin Harrison Jr.'s. That's Kyle's fault, bro. I don't listen, I know, and Chris, you're gonna know this too. I, you know, I know you're in a chat. I know that there's some times where Marv doesn't run the best route. He doesn't get the biggest separation. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. The bottom of the line is that if you throw the ball to Marv, I don't care if he has one inch of separation. If you throw the ball to Marv, good things are gonna happen. And we saw that in this game. That's what they had to do. They had to throw the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. And every time they did, they made plays. And I'm, I just can't talk about enough how the, the way that Kyle McCord played in this game was terrible. I, in my opinion, it was terrible. Obviously, the offense scored in the second half. I don't think that was even from him playing better. I think that was just from instead of guys being three yards open or one, two yards open, they were 10 yards open. So he was able to just chuck it up and let them run under it. 
you look at the the two plays that should have been touchdowns in this game that were not. You look at the Marvin Harrison Jr. play. I don't know what Kyle McCord's read is. I can't wait to see that. But when Marvin Harrison Jr. is 50 yards down the field before you even throw the ball, and he's got his his guy beat by 15 yards, that's a problem, regardless of how you spin it. Your other, your other options were obviously not open for you to get that far. So maybe that's just an issue where he needs to get through his reads faster. I don't know, because most of the time when I'm watching Kyle, he seems like he's getting through his reads too fast, and it's not giving guys a chance to to get open. You're, you're getting off your read before they even come open. So I don't know. I was calling for Devin Brown. I'm not going to be, I'm going to be honest. Like the whole first half after I seen what was happening, I'm like, look, it's time put him in. And I was, I was hoping that Ryan Day was going to do it, but he didn't. He stuck with it. Whatever. I don't know. I, I don't think that we're ever going to see a quarterback change now unless Ohio state loses a game, um, which is still something that I think could happen. Like, I've been saying every time that I get on this show, I've been saying that I think that this offense is going to lose a game for Ohio State, and I could still see that. I, I don't. They're not necessarily getting better. You look back at the Notre Dame game, and really the only offensive points that we generated outside of the last drive was when Trevion Henderson took it for sixty yards or whatever. He's. I mean, you take that play away, Ohio State loses that game fourteen to three. Could you imagine what our fan base will be saying if we lost fourteen to three to Notre Dame? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the grade. I, I'm going to grade what, what Kyle played as a D. I mean, whatever. He he completed some of the deep balls that, that he needed to complete, even though they were just terrible throws. But, you know, the one throw to uh, Kate Stover was a good one, and the one throw to Marvin Harrison Jr. on the sideline was actually a really good throw. That's what doesn't make sense about this quarterback situation is that we'll see Kyle McCord not throw the ball when people are open, We'll see him throw terrible, terrible balls sometimes. And then he'll come back and later in the game he'll throw he'll he'll make a throw like the one to Marvin Harrison Jr. that was just like that looked like how CJ CJ Stroud would have put that ball in that exact spot. That and and that's what I think like you look at the end of the Notre Dame game also, the throw to Emeka, the throw to Marv. CJ Stroud would have probably put those balls in that exact spot. But then you have to factor in the entire game because What's going to end up happening is that our defense is going to have one game where maybe they're not adjusting well to what the offense is doing, and they're going to give up 14 points, 17 points, and you know, 21 points even in the first half, and the team's going to be down really bad. And then Ryan Day is going to do nothing but throw the ball. Teams are going to start dropping their defenders, and we're going to get into some trouble. I think Ohio State's going to lose a game because of that. And even when you're talking about the quarterback situation, another thing that's not talked about enough to me is the run game. If you look at the beginning of the year when Ohio State was doing their quarterback battle, I don't care how you want to spin it. The the offense moved better, and the running game especially was way better when Devin Brown was on the field. And I've been saying this over and over again. Everybody keeps calling the offensive line soft and garbage and blah, 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 blah. I don't think that it's necessarily their fault. Like I think that they're doing what they're supposed to do most of the time, but when you're trying to run when you're trying to run the ball and first off you're not taking away a defender. When you have Devin Brown out there you are. You're reading one defender and you're taking them completely out of the play cuz it doesn't matter what way he goes, you're going to read the defender and right there you're creating a mismatch for your offensive line because you're either making it hat on a hat or you're making your offensive line have an extra defender. And that that thing that alone I think is is probably the biggest problem with this with this offense in terms of like being productive because if they can run the ball they're going to be productive the throwing game is going to open up but if you look back at Ryan Day's teams like I don't care what people say about Ryan Day's offense and how he likes to throw the ball Ryan Day in 2019 and 2020 had a 2,000 yard rusher and then a running back who ran for what like 260 yards. 280 yards and then um and then got hurt the last game so he didn't get to play. I mean what was the difference in those years? It was because they had Justin Fields and he was able to read someone and he was able to be a threat to run the ball for at least a few yards even when he was hurt. Justin Fields was hurt and they were not running him a lot. He was still reading a defender and he was still taking that guy out of the play and the run game was dominant because of that. And I know that we had JK Dobbins and then Trey Sermon. I know that they're probably better than the running backs we have now, but 
I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't necessarily know if Trey Sermon is. Would he be the number one running back on this team? I mean, maybe. I don't know. He was really good, but he also had Justin Fields. So that you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say about it anymore because I think this is just what we have, and I think that it's going to lose us a game. And I don't think that Ryan Day is going to make a change. I really, I don't think that he's that type of coach that would make a change midseason uh, with his quarterback. So. Quarterback gets a, what did I say, a D? I'll give him a D because I don't think that he played this terrible first half and this phenomenal second half. I think that he played a terrible first half and the entire team picked him up in the second half and they played better as a, as a whole team. The, the offense, and I'm going to grade them out as a D also overall um, for the offense just because, like I said, the offense really, in my opinion, only scored, what, what did I say, 23, 24 points? Um, I think 23. The offense really only scored 23 points. I mean, you can count that 30-yard drive at the end of the game if you want. Uh, when Maryland already knew that they lost, I don't care. I'm not counting that because that's not realistic when you look at how many points are you going to score against a good team when the game is close late in the game. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm done with talking about that now. <laughs> Again, quarterback situation has me fired up just because. I think that it's holding this team back, and I don't know. I, I don't know if there's an answer. I don't know if there's ever going to be an answer. What? I, let's get into more positive. So, uh, my players of the game. I wanted to talk about. I have an offensive player of the game, a defensive player of the game, and overall. Um, so for offense, it's got to be Marvin Harrison Jr. Right? Like, I mean, what was his stat line? Let me see. Marvin Harrison Jr. went for. Uh, let's see, eight kept eight receptions, 163 yards and a touchdown, and he really scored two touchdowns. He should have scored, scored, he should have only scored two, but at the end of the game, he scored a touchdown. They caught a phantom penalty, um, and then he came right back and scored the next touchdown. And then the other one was obviously that one where he was all alone in the middle of the field, and the ball was just, he had to just stand there and catch it like a punt. Um, that probably should have been a touchdown if it was read properly, but whatever. Either way you put it, 163 yards, uh, one touchdown was a phenomenal game. Um, and I hope to see more of that from him. I hope that we keep drawing up plays from him, uh, or for him, excuse me. I actually, there was one play that I uh, recorded because I liked it so much. I think I'm going to post it a little bit later. But there was a play where Ohio State ran a, fa a fake screen to Marvin Harrison Jr. and had him kind of come back for the screen. And uh, the receiver, I forget who it was that was next to him, acted like they were going to block. And then Marv uh, ran like a wheel route after he did the fake screen, and he was wide open. That was the one where he made the a really good catch on the sideline and then uh, was able to keep going downfield. Again, I think they just need to keep drawing up shit like that for him, man. Like get Marv out there in different positions, have him running all kinds of different routes, and get him the ball because I think that Marv also this year has been decent after the catch. Now, he's not creating a ton of separation, so he's not getting like, you know, housing slants or nothing like that. But when he does catch the ball, he does usually get positive yards after he catches it. So I love that from him. Keep targeting him. And that's really the, the, going to be the strong suit of this team is throwing the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, getting into the defense, my defensive player of the game is going to be uh, Josh Proctor. Obviously had a pick six. I mean, was blasting people. He, was, he made one play that I thought was probably one of the best plays of the game that nobody's probably going to talk about uh, where – Maryland did a fake handoff to the left, and then they uh, had their quarterback run to the right. And he, when he ran to the right, he still was able to pass the ball, and he was looking to pass it. Uh, Proctor got in between him and the defender and just played the defender for just enough time. And then at the last second, as soon as the quarterback got to the line of scrimmage, he pounced on it, and Tua didn't want nothing to do with that, or Tua Leah, whatever. He didn't want nothing to do with that. He just fell to the ground as soon as Josh Proctor started running at him. Plays like that, people don't talk about a lot, but that was a great play. And overall, he was making plays the entire game. So Josh Proctor is the defensive player of the game. And then uh, Chris Drew has a question here. He says, how worried are you about Emeka? So, yeah, I, I think Emeka is going to be all right. I think he just got like a bruise or something. I mean, that's what I've heard. But I, I hope he's going to be all right. At the same time, I think that Emeka, losing Emeka, he would be easier to replace than Marvin Harrison Jr., obviously. Um Emeka is just really good at like picking apart zones, in my opinion. Um, and so it kind of makes it to where a team has to play man, which then they have to be man coverage on Marv. But 
if he can't play this game, I think that's not a problem as long as he's good for the Penn State game. I think that he will be. I haven't heard anything uh, that says says otherwise, but we'll see. <laughs> Rashawn says, please reboot the offense. It stinks. I agree with you, dude. I don't know. I think that either one of two things needs to happen. This is my opinion, right? I think that either one of two things needs to happen. I think that we need to just start Devin and just be like, okay, look, this Kyle shit's not working. And I I think that's not ever going to happen, but I, that's what I think that it's probably the best option. Um, because I can imagine that right now, if Devin Brown had all the reps that Kyle McCord had, I don't care what people say about how he played in the games that he played early. If you give him every single rep that Kyle McCord had in this season so far, I think that the the whole identity and the whole view of this Ohio State team is completely different. I think that Ohio State's probably number one in the country right now. I think that people are looking at Ohio State as the team to beat. And I don't I, I could be wrong. Maybe not. Maybe he would throw 10 interceptions a game, but I don't think that's the case. Um the other thing that I think could happen that could help if if we're gonna run with Kyle, Ryan Day needs to right now turn into an offensive coordinator who is like a Lincoln Riley type or um, you know, like a uh, one of those types of guys where or like a Steve Sarkeesian type where he needs to scheme his guys open starting right now. Easy reads for your quarterback, RPOs, stuff like that. Like that, that's gonna have to be what we do because if they're not gonna change the offense to that style and we're just gonna keep doing this, they're gonna lose us a game. And I, I made a joke earlier, but it's not really a joke. I mean, I said uh, to some of my friends that it's all it's gonna be all fun and games until we lose to Penn State seventeen to three. I mean, I could see our defense holding Penn State to seventeen. I don't know if this team could score seventeen points on Penn State. And a lot of people have been talking about um, how Kyle McCord. One of his biggest things is that he doesn't turn the ball over, but he's throwing the ball to the other team. They're just not catching it. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Like if you look at the Maryland game, there was a one of the balls that he threw in that game. He threw it actually to Marv. But Marv knocked it out of the guy's hands. But I mean, it was basically straight to the defender. I mean, I don't know. And the Maryland, or sorry, excuse me, the Notre Dame game, that game could have easily ended with Kyle McCord throwing an interception because he threw it right to the guy. He just didn't catch it. So I don't know. I, I don't want to hate on Kyle too much. I think that he can get better. He has to get a lot better at seeing the field. He has some arm talent. He's just not confident in it. And I don't know if that's going to change, in a, especially as fast as we need it to. We got Penn State coming up in two weeks. We we don't really have time anymore. Like if you lose that game, you're probably not winning the Big Ten, and you're probably not going to the playoffs. So, and because I think that I think you could probably lose to Michigan, which I hate to say, but you could probably lose to Michigan and still make the playoffs. But I don't think that they could lose to Penn State and still make the playoffs, because um, then it would require what Michigan would have to beat Penn State in that situation. Ohio State would have to beat Michigan. Maybe then Ohio State would have the um, the tiebreaker, but I, I don't know. Regardless, they need to get something figured out pretty quick. Cause I mean, I, I could I I hate I just hate saying that I could see this team scoring less than ten points in a game. I think that we've been lucky actually. We've been lucky to not already score less than ten points in a game. If you look back at the Notre Dame game, like I said, Trevion Henderson made a play where. That was really the only offensive scoring we had the entire game. We got a field goal, and then you go to the very last drive. But that last drive doesn't happen if Travion Henderson doesn't score that touchdown. Are we going to bank our offense on Travion Henderson being able to take a one run 60 yards for a touchdown? Okay, cool, because there was a guy who had a chance to make the tackle. That guy makes that tackle. Do, does Ohio State lose that game 14-3? to I mean, I don't know. All right, let's get back into it here. The uh, – the, I did have an overall player of the game. Um, overall, the player of the game for me is Josh Proctor. Um, he was the same, you know, again, he was my defensive player of the game, so it makes sense. But even when you look at special teams, he made multiple tackles on uh, kick coverage that I mean, he's just a better athlete than most people out there. And one of them, I think, was the probably the one of the biggest plays of the game. People don't realize that when someone makes a big hit or a big-time tackle or they, you know, basically just a super athletic play and you pop somebody and everybody hears that and you get up in your hype, those types of things win games. Again, I hate to keep looking back at it, but look back at Michigan last year. 
I can think of a play in the third quarter of that game where Ohio State threw the ball out to the flats to, I think, uh, Mayan Williams, and one of Michigan's players came up and popped him. Their whole sideline got lit. They were jumping around. They were lit. They have adrenaline. I mean, again, just kind of looking at it scientifically. At that point, their adrenaline is super high. That That's a team that's going to be on top of their shit. And Josh Proctor did that in this game on, on the kickoff. Uh, I think it was in the third quarter also. Uh, Ohio State, I think, tied the game like 17-17. to 17. And then on that kickoff return, Proctor ran down the field and popped the dude right in the chest. And that got the team lit. And after that, they ran, they ran away with the game. I just I think that people uh, people don't realize how how big of an impact on every single player on the team that a play like that can have. So, like somebody's trying to open my damn door. All right. Anyway. Um, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of wrap this up now though. If you guys have any questions or anything else, put it in the chat for me. Um, like I said, obviously like the video and all that good stuff if you enjoy it. Um, so just my take, my last thing is just my takeaways. I know we've been kind of talking about them the whole time, but just to put them in words, the the offense has to get better, and I don't know if it can, honestly. I I think the only way this offense is going to get better without a change in personnel is going to be Ryan Day is going to have to be playoff Ryan Day every single time that he comes out this year, especially in against any good team. So, And then as far as the defense goes, I think they just need to shore up the linebackers um, they need to get them kind of attacking more in the run game. Uh, and then the secondary, just keep playing like you are. D-line, keep playing like you are. And teams are going to have a lot of trouble scoring on this team. Um, overall, I still think that this team could make a run and you know could win some close games to like Penn State and Michigan and then end up being in the playoffs. And then who knows what happens after that because playoff Ryan Day with 30 days to prepare is a problem. Um, but... <laughs> they better get going now because there's only two weeks until the Penn State game. So, um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate everyone coming out. You guys have a good day.